virus. Um, as Norville said, Jonathan and I work for Virginia Department of Health, and we work in Central Shenandoah Health District, which is one of 35 health districts in Virginia, and we're composed of five counties and five cities and about a 2,500 square mile radius. Um, we serve over 293,000 people with services that include disease monitoring and surveillance, um, such as um, the case with Zika, immunizations, family planning, WIC nutrition programs, and environmental health services. And I'm the health director for the district, and Jonathan's the epidemiologist, and he can uh, tell you what that job entails. Thank you, Dr. Cornegy. Uh, yes, as the district epidemiologist, I manage our local communicable disease program. Uh, ultimately, there are disease conditions within the state of Virginia that are reportable by hospitals and physicians. And I work with seven health departments in our district to receive those reports and then conduct investigations on that. We also have uh, surveillance that follows the investigation, so kind of tracking numbers, looking at trends, trying to determine who's getting sick where within our communities. And then lastly, there's a sort of a health information and education piece where we then take our surveillance data and, and kind of translate that into public health action and outreach. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, we'll get on to talking about um, Zika. Um, and Zika virus is primarily spread through the bite of an infected mosquito. Um, the mosquito type um, in Virginia is the Aedes albopictus, or the Asian tiger mosquito. Um, the incubation period is about um, three to 14 days. And actually, most people who get the disease actually don't get sick. About 20% um, of people um, who were um, bitten by it a um, mosquito that carries Zika will get sick, um, and the most common symptoms are fever, rash, joint pain, and conjunctivitis, but it's typically a pretty mild um, illness and um, usually lasts um, several days to about a week. Um, there's really no treatment for Zika virus infection um, other than supportive care, um, just treating, treating the symptoms, um, and at this point in time, we have no vaccine or medications available to treat, treat or prevent Zika infection. Um, the first case of locally spread Zika virus um, occurred in Brazil and was confirmed in uh, May of 2015. The virus actually has um, circulated for a long time in Africa and parts of Asia, but it's relatively new to the Western Hemisphere. It's thought that about 1.5 million people in Brazil have been infected with the virus, and then the virus has spread um, over the course of the last year or so throughout countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And you all are probably aware that we've had um, some local spread in very confined areas in, in uh, Miami, Florida. Um, due to the mobile nature of our society, we expect that the numbers of um, imported cases or cases that are identified in travelers visiting or returning to the U.S. will continue to um, increase over the course of time. Um, the populations who are at risk for Zika virus currently are anyone living in or traveling to an area that has active transmission. That would include the countries that we talked about, as well as that small area in uh, Miami, Florida. Um, the potential populations at risk um, are everyone in Virginia um, during mosquito season, which occurs from about May 1st through October um, 31st. Um, the uh, local transmission would occur if somebody came into the country with Zika, got bitten by a mosquito. Um, the mosquito would then pick up the virus and could um, transmit it to um, another person in the U.S. Um, in terms of Zika virus disease in Virginia, as of yesterday, um, Virginia Department of Health had reported 80 cases of Zika virus disease in adult residents of Virginia to the Centers um, for Disease, Disease Control and Prevention. All of these cases in Virginia have been travel associated. We've not had any um, locally transmitted cases in Virginia. Um, as I said, Florida reported the first cases of local, uh, locally transmitted Zika in the continental United States in, in August. Um, again, the transmission of disease, um, uh, Zika virus, is primarily transmitted by um, two different mosquitoes. Um, in Virginia, um, the um, Aedes albopictus, or the Asian tiger mosquito, is predominant. Um, in other countries, the Aedes Aegypti or yellow fever mosquito is um, the most common um, transmitter um, of Zika virus. 
Um, both of these um, mosquitoes can also transmit dengue and chikungunya viruses, which are closely related to the Zika virus. Um, both of these mosquitoes circulate in Virginia, but primarily we have the Asian tiger mosquito as the, the, um, the biggest um, pest in, in our state. Um, again, mosquitoes become infected by feeding on infected persons, and Zika virus remains in an infected person's blood for about a week. Um, transmission is through multiple um, routes. The most common form of transmission, as we talked about, would be from a mosquito bite from an infected mosquito. Um, Zika can also be transmitted um, from mother to child um, during pregnancy or at the time of delivery. And there's also sexual transmission reported, both from men to women and from women to, to men. Um, spread through blood transfusions has been reported, although that's much less common. And the Food and Drug Administration, because of this, has recommended deferral of blood donations from individuals who are recent travelers to Zika-affected areas. Um, health concerns associated with Zika, the primary um, health concerns that we worry about are, are pregnancy related. There have been reports of microcephaly or smaller than normal head size in infants who are born to mothers um, affected um, with the Zika virus. There are other poor pregnancy outcomes in babies of mothers who are infected with Zika virus um, while pregnant. Um, CDC looked at um, the increase in microcephaly that occurred in Brazil during um, the, the height of Zika outbreak there, and they have confirmed the link between Zika virus and um, microcephaly. However, the incidence of microcephaly and, and poor pregnancy outcomes in general for women exposed to Zika virus is um, really unknown. Um, there's also a link between Zika and a rare neurologic condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, which can cause um, paralysis, um, which is typically reversible over a long course of time, but that's, a, that's another complication of Zika. As we said at the beginning of the presentation, the vast majority of people, over 80% of people who get infected with Zika, have no symptoms, um, and the 20% who do have symptoms, um, it's usually, usually fairly mild. Um, obviously, our major concern for Zika is for pregnant women um, in Zika because of the potential for um, bad pregnancy outcomes. Um, at this time, the CDC advises that pregnant women avoid travel to Zika-affected um, countries. Um, if travel is unavoidable, um, really um, trying to protect yourself against mosquito bites, wearing um, long sleeves, long pants. Um, using EPA-approved um, mosquito um, repellent um, and um, uh, sleeping indoors um, with windows um, closed um, at the nighttime. Um, if symptoms start within two weeks of travel, we definitely recommend that folks um, talk with their health care provider and consider um, testing for Zika. Um, if uh, women are pregnant and have um, no symptoms, again, talking with a health care provider before travel and upon returning um, would be advised. Um, the virus will not cause infections in a baby conceived after the virus has been um, cleared um, from the blood, and there's no evidence that Zika virus would affect future pregnancies. Um, in terms of Zika prevention strategies, um, avoiding um, travel to Zika endemic areas um, would be the, 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 the biggest um, strategy. Um, again, until more is known, the CDC recommends um, special precautions for pregnant women and women trying to become pregnant. Um, pregnant women in any trimester should consider postponing travel to an affected area. Um, it's really not clear. Um, when during pregnancy Zika could have its biggest impact. Um, for most processes, we worry most about first trimester, but um, it's unclear whether um, you know, Zika would have impacts at any time during pregnancy. Um, women who are trying to become pregnant should certainly consult with a healthcare provider be before traveling to an affected area. 
Um, avoiding mosquito bites um, is one of the biggest strategies to preventing um, infection with Zika. Um, again, using EPA registered insect repellents and using according to the product label, um, insect repellents with DEET are safe in pregnancy, so they, they can be used. Um, using um, permethrin-treated clothing can be another strategy. Um, covering exposed skin by wearing long sleeves, pants, and hats and sleeping indoors in rooms with screen windows or air conditioning or bed netting if you're exposed to the outdoors would be other strategies to avoid um, Zika infection. Um, one of the um, modes of transmission um, can be um, sexual transmission. So we do recommend for men who reside in or have traveled to an area of active Zika virus transmission and have a pregnant partner, they should abstain from sexual activity or consistently and correctly use a condom um, during the duration of the pregnancy. Um, current recommendations for men and women who are wishing to conceive, who travel to areas with local transmission of Zika are really in flux. Um, the World Health Organization recently advised um, waiting about six months with or without symptoms um, to consider um, conceiving. That takes into account a couple different things. One is the fact that most people who get infected with the Zika virus have no symptoms. Um, the other issue is that Zika seems to remain in semen a lot longer um, than in the blood, and you know, one study showed it could remain in semen for up to 62 days. Um, in terms of mosquito control in Virginia, um, most of this is locally funded, and it's fairly limited to some of the more densely populated um, counties and cities. Um, really, in central Shenandoah Health District, um, we don't have any local um, mosquito control. Um, the main way to control the Asian tiger mosquitoes that spread Zika is um, by house-to-house -house inspection and treatment. This particular type of mosquito um, likes to breed in um, man-made containers of water. So eliminating those from around your house is going to be the best way to prevent um, breeding of these mosquitoes. Um, they do not breed in groundwater sources, such as puddles or ditches. Um, places where you'll find these mosquitoes breeding would be um, pots, um, bird baths, um, any, any man-made container um, that, that holds water. So really um, cleaning up around the yard um, will prevent these mosquitoes from breeding. They also have um, a predilection for staying close to where they breed. They travel only a few hundred yards away from breeding sites. So really keeping, keeping those areas away from your house will um, protect you um, from getting bitten by the mosquitoes that could um, could transmit disease. Um, VDH, um, like you know, most most um, states um, in the nation have had um, uh, responses um, to the Zika threat. Um, we've coordinated with a lot of public and private um, partners. Um, we've been doing um, talks such as this um, to. Um, uh, public groups and clinicians trying to raise awareness. Our state lab, um, or DCLS, has capability of doing um, Zika testing, and we've been a point of coordination for testing. Um, at this point in time, there is one commercially available um, test for Zika. Um, it's a test for um, um, the Zika virus um, itself. Um, it has a pretty short window where it would remain positive, probably within a week or so of developing symptoms. Um, there are other further tests that um, we can do to look for evidence of Zika infection. So at this point, we're really advising that um, most clinicians um, coordinate with their local health departments to get testing done um, through the um, state lab. Um, confirmatory testing can also be sent to the CDC, and um, local health departments can help in um, managing um, that testing. Um, as Jonathan said, one of our roles is certainly in conducting um, disease surveillance. 
um, Zika is a reportable disease, so all suspected and confirmed cases are um, required to be reported um, to the local health departments. As I said, um, local health departments can provide consultation and facilitate lab testing um, as needed. Um, one of our main focus areas is on um, pregnant women who travel to affected areas, and we have um, criteria um, for testing, and we're always happy to um, address any questions that people have in terms of symptoms, travel, or the need for testing. Um, BDH has also been doing mosquito trapping and testing um, mosquitoes for any evidence of Zika, and to date there's been no evidence of any Zika-infected mosquitoes um, within Virginia. Um, again, BDH has tried to coordinate um, preparation and response. Um, particularly to any um, evidence of local transmission in Virginia, which we've not seen, luckily. Um, we have a Zika task force, which is a multi-agency task force with BDH as a lead. Um, we've developed a Zika action plan, a Zika work group, and in conjunction with the CDC, um, we are also involved in registering patients um, within the Zika pregnancy registry. Um, if pregnant women um, have confirmed or suspected cases of Zika, um, we ask them to um, get involved with a pregnancy registry so that we can track um, pregnancy outcomes and we'll also be tracking um, infants up until the first year of life. This will really help us to add um, information um, about the course of Zika, how it affects pregnancy. Unfortunately, at this point in time, there's just a lot of unknowns in this disease, so we really have to build a, a bigger database um, to give patients a little bit better guidance about how this disease acts and its um, you know, potential um, impacts on pregnancy. Um, what communities can do in terms of Zika um, response? One is certainly to pay attention to travel advisories regarding Zika-affected areas. The CDC has a traveler's health page where you can look at um, advisories for Zika or other um, health concerns. Um, if you're traveling to a Zika-affected area, um, we'd ask that you take steps to try to avoid mosquito bites for three weeks after returning to the U.S. Obviously, sometimes that's easier said than done, but the rationale for that recommendation would be that um, this would avoid um, local transmission of um, imported Zika cases. Um, Avoiding, you know, mosquito breeding areas and trying to um, make sure that your home and your neighborhood don't have areas where mosquitoes um, can be breeding is um, a big part of what communities can do um, to prevent, prevent Zika spread um, within their areas. And then certainly, um, you know, taking personal prevention methods against mosquitoes, you know, whether you're traveling or, or in Virginia. Um, again, the Zika prevention method would be, you know, wearing light-colored long sleeves, shirts, and trousers, using EPA-approved insect repellents, sleeping under a bed net if you're outside in a Zika endemic area, and then around the house getting rid of stagnant water from places where mosquitoes breed, such as old containers, flower pots, um, used tires, and the like. Um, there are an awful lot of Zika information and resources available um, on uh, websites. Um, Virginia Department of Health um, has a wonderful Zika information page at bdh.virginia.gov. Um, the CDC is also a very good source of um, information and travel um, notices. Um, so any of these um, sources would probably be able to answer almost any question um, you would have about Zika. Um, that's the basics of Zika that we wanted to cover today, so we wanted to leave some time to um, take questions. Okay, thank you Dr. Cornegay. Uh, we are now going to open it up to questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you do have a question that uh, you'd like to ask, uh, please type it into the chat box, and we will take them 
uh, from the first one received. Jonathan, did you have anything to um, share that we didn't we didn't talk about already? Yeah, I can I can add a few things. Um, the the first the the preventing mosquito bites. I th I think it's really key for folks to to really realize that that's a, a twofold type of prevention. The preventing mosquito bites, especially if you're traveling abroad or to areas with local transmission, you know it, it helps prevent you from acquiring the virus from a mosquito bite. But when you return back home to, say, Virginia, uh, if for whatever reason you were exposed, preventing mosquito, bites when, preventing mosquito bites when you're back home also can prevent you from infecting local mosquito populations. And so that's, that's kind of one of our big goals, especially when we have travelers returning um, and they're contacting their providers or uh, contacting the health department. You know, we try to advise that when they, uh, after they return from their trips. The, the mosquitoes, the Asian tiger mosquito, uh, the fact that it, it is a, a uh, it does breed in man-made containers. Also, it can breed in in holes in trees. Uh, that's just just like one small caveat. But by and large, in in all of our communities, it's more of a, a man-made container. So whether it's gutters that aren't cleaned out, or you've got flower pots around, or a wheelbarrow, you know, those are sort of areas where if they collect water, uh, and the water will stay there for uh, a fair amount of time, then uh, you've got the the possibility of uh, having mosquitoes breed and, and kind of multiply there. Okay, we do have a question in the chat box. Uh, the question we have here is, have any cases been found in the United States outside of Florida? I'm assuming that that question is asking about like local, tr locally transmitted cases outside of Florida. Uh, each each state is monitoring and tracking total number of Zika cases. Uh, and, and like Dr. Cornegie said, for Virginia, for example, as of I believe yesterday, uh, we had posted on the, the VDH website 80, 80 cases, 80 have been identified in Virginia. All of those have been travel associated. When we when we have someone contact the health department uh, because they're concerned about Zika virus, and as we go through that process, if they get tested through their medical provider, or if we do the testing through the health department, um, you know those results if they come back positive, it goes through a CDC case definition to be counted as a case or not. And usually, any of those positive results uh, require us to do further investigation, and so we'll take a look at. You know a number of different factors. We're going to look at you know sexual history. We're going to look at travel history. Uh, take a look at the symptoms. When did they start? How did those uh, kind of pair up to the travel or sexual contact? Uh, and and to see whether or not there is a concern of local transmission. And for those 80 cases, we haven't had anything uh, to suggest local transmission, but rather uh, all travel travel related. And there was another question about Florida, perhaps, on there. With Florida, as of, because I think I was looking on their website just uh, earlier this week, there, there are two specific locations in Miami-Dade County um, where they've identified local transmission and positive mosquito populations. There are a handful, less than a handful of cases in Florida that are currently under investigation. One, I think, is in Tampa, and the other is in Palm Beach, where they're continuing to do those investigations to try to identify where the person may have been exposed to Zika virus, because I don't believe they had uh, any kind of international travel. And, and kind of as a part of that, there's kind of an environmental health aspect where they will be going out and, and trying to collect mosquito pools and testing mosquitoes in those areas as well. So that, that's currently ongoing. Is 
Uh, we have another question. Uh, the question is, is there any concern about mosquitoes breeding in, like, the family swimming pool? Um, swimming pools that are chlorinated and, you know, properly treated, there's no risk of um, breeding of mosquitoes. Now, a small kiddie pool, which has untreated water, you know, that would be a risk. And for something like that or a bird bath, um, basically the recommendations would be to um, tip the water out at least once a week and kind of rinse it out, um, particularly if there's any, you know, evidence of any um, mosquito breeding. But if you um, get rid of the water at least once a week and dump it, um, you should be, should be good. But main, well-maintained um, large swimming pools that are chlorinated um, wouldn't be a mosquito breeding site. And they do have they do have larvicides at you know some of your typical stores like Lowe's or whatever. Uh, they have large uh, circular donut dunks uh, as they're called, or they even have them in like granulo form uh, for maybe like flower pots or smaller areas where you know things that you can't physically tip, you can get the the larvicide dunks, and those are effective, and those don't harm uh, animals or humans or anything else like that, other than just the mosquito lar larvae. Another common question that we get um, is whether there's any animal reservoirs for um, for Zika. You know, people certainly worry about their, their their furry friends, and there are no animal reservoirs for Zika. So it's a mosquito to human um, disease. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have uh, any other questions they'd like to ask? Okay, we have another question. Uh, how does the CDC prioritize uh, resources as far as uh, something like this is concerned? Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to assume that when they say something like this, they're talking about kind of an emerging disease condition that is uh, impacting the country. Uh, similar to, to something like Ebola, and you know, to a certain extent, uh, the CDC with uh, Congress will, you know, potentially find funding and, and then distribute that between states based on I think generally its population. Uh, but in terms of the actual disease condition that that uh, is is of concern, the CDC along with the state uh, departments of health will will kind of discuss you know, the information that they know at the time, the questions that they have, and the gaps in their knowledge. Uh, and, and as we kind of progress through a situation like this, to, to me, especially from an epi perspective, it's really about identifying who are the people at high risk. Uh, for Zika, in this particular case, you know, um, it's definitely pregnant women with the infants that could develop microcephaly. That, that's been, you know, the high risk group that we've been really focused on. Back when we had H1N1 and uh, in the, the pandemic influenza, you know, uh, pregnant women were part of that high risk group that we identified. But into, into that, that outbreak, we actually were, were finding that uh, a number of, of pediatrics, kids under 18, were another significant high risk group for, for deaths due to influenza. So whenever we have a situation like this occur, uh, the big priority uh, from a prevention and control perspective from the CDC and the state health departments is really who is at high risk, how do they get infected, and how can we prevent that? Okay, uh, next question we have is primarily for uh, our ASQ section. The question is, can a certificate of participation be sent to our email? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. We will send a certificate to the email address that you use to register through Eventbrite. Uh, that would be the email address we have on file for you. 
and everybody that registered through Eventbrite will be receiving, uh, who, who uh, was present for the webinar will be receiving a certificate uh, from what we've done today. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, it looks like there aren't any more questions uh, to be asked. Uh, so we thank everyone for participating with us today. And we also thank uh, Dr. Laura Cornegay and Jonathan Falk uh, for presenting uh, for, our, for us today. Uh, one note we want to include is for those of you uh, who want to go back and take a second look at this webinar, it has been recorded. Uh, we will be uploading it to our section's YouTube channel. Uh, our section name is ASQ Blue Ridge 1108. So uh, if you do go and visit YouTube, we have this. We will have this webinar as well as others that we have uh, done earlier uh, over the course of this year also posted there. So uh, you know, take a moment to take a look at it if you do have time. And uh, Thanks all for joining us, and I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you, Normal. Thanks, Thank Normal. You.